Welcome to Show Studio's live panel discussions. In these discussions, experts from all parts of the industry discuss and debate the most important fashion shows, fashion week shows of the season. Today, on the last day of London Fashion Week, we're going to be discussing Richard Quinn. Today I'm hosting, my name's Rebecca Gonzalez. I'm a freelance fashion writer and fashion director of Culture Whisper, and I'll leave it to my lovely guests to introduce themselves. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Grace Woodward, and I'm a fashion consultant and commentator today, I guess. <laughs> Hi, I'm Danielle Wodowichin. I'm a podcast producer, and I'm culture editor at Matches Fashion. Hi, I'm Fabian Kishias, and I'm a designer. Which camera am I looking at? That one. Hi, I'm Kobe. I am a freelance fashion stylist and fashion consultant also. Great. So um, today we're talking about Richard Quinn, which is a show that happened last night. Um, you guys have had a look at some of the imagery, and we've had a bit of an off-camera discussion. Uh, one of the first topics that we were talking about was kind of the use of print, which Richard's pretty much famous for. Um, what did you think of the prints this season? And they feel very, they feel very um, signature to him. Yes. You couldn't mistake this show for no, anybody else. It didn't else feel similar to anything else that he yeah. has done. Were you hoping to see more of a movement in print? Do you think that this is him building his signature? It's, it's easy to forget how young a designer he is because he created such a buzz so quickly. Mm. But this is perhaps, is it his third or fourth full collection? Yeah. So are we, are we expecting too much from him at an early stage if we were asking for too, more mm. of an elevation? It feels like this season he spent more time refining more so the shapes than mm. the technique rather than the prints because he knows how to do that obviously. Mm -hmm. He's also always sort of drawn to these like couture shapes and you know a lot of craftsmanship and I think he really refined them this season. Yeah, I think that I, I don't expect, given the sort of business model that he seems to be following, I don't expect him to kind of move away from the floral, mm -hmm. given that there is such a high um, demand for floral at all times. Mm. I think that it would be smart for him to continue that. Mm -hmm. This is also a spring summer just, collection as well, sorry? so this is a spring yeah, summer exactly. collection, so it's like yeah. a no-brainer. You yeah. If you were going to move into anything else, you wouldn't do it now. Yeah, mm. but I think, it, as you said, the shapes and silhouettes I thought were really, really interesting. Mm. It feels mm. like he was, he was aiming at a younger silhouette in places, um, yeah. a younger, more, more romantic, more sexy silhouette. Mm. For, yeah a woman from my perspective. Yeah. But um, Grace, I don't know if you have anything to say on that. Oh, I have a lot to say about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I would start off by saying, you know, this is, um, this is like the fashionista show of all shows. This is a sort of, you see the, the comments on Instagram, everyone's like, oh, fashion is back. You know, um, and I think that, um, as a fashion student, when I graduated, this was exactly the kind of show that I would have loved. It's like fantasy, it's kind of out there, it's a bit bonkers, you know. Yeah. It's, a, it's a real visual feast. He's a master of showmanship, which is not the sort of usual thing that you... You haven't seen this in London for quite a long time. You know, he quotes Galliano very much as at Dior as his one of his influences. Mm -hmm. I can see kind of like... Christian Lacroix, I can see mm -hmm. Ungaro, you know, the big, heady 80s days of the big Parisian catwalks. Um, it's, it's kind of an interesting contrast to see this in, in London. And he talks about the whole, and it's been a big thing talked about today, you know, nobody's talking about Brexit and fashion's role within uh, culture of, you know, does this feel kind of like ridiculous and frivolous as fashion is always mooted as being like, you know, frivolous. And I think there's definitely a place for this. They definitely, we just definitely need it now, even if it's a, dis a distraction mm -hmm. from like the, the, the sort of hell that's going on outside of nobody knows what's going on. So let's have beauty uplift us. I think it has a, a real place for this. Um, these days, having worked in fashion for like 25 years, personally, I'm more concerned, but this is my kind of journey about the, the sort of representation of women and the sort of the, the responsibility that designers have, even if it's a fantasy or a dream, of what is the fantasy or dream that you are portraying, because I think everybody, whilst making images like this that go around globally, what those then portray. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll get into that, but... Um, yeah. 
That's, but that's really interesting because it's true that it, it, Fashion Week has continued as normal in a lot of ways in regards to Brexit, but also the fact that we've had Extinction Rebellion talking about all this action. And it hasn't really impacted in the way that I think that the um, activists would like it to have done. Do you think that fashion is... I did see that some people are not showing. Uh -huh. yeah, so, um, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to remember. The, the Asia label that came out of... You know that they do all of that tie-dyed stuff with it? It's all sewn together. Uh -huh. Yeah, so um, that was... They, they put a note up on Instagram mm. saying note to self or notes not showing this season not doing a new collection um letting the recipe marinade for a bit and then it got taken down really quite quickly and i was a bit like oh okay that's interesting um but, but that could be for any reason that could be not enough funding to build a collection yeah just not just you know but then the to make a note of it it just felt whether it was about i mean there's a, the other question you know richard quinn show we were just talking about it richard talks about his commitment to sustainability, which he has a print studio in the UK. Um, I'm going to mention that he's done, he got funding from H&M, and then more recently, which I think that was a prize as a student, he had to do a collection for them, but more recently he's collaborated with Debenhams, which is, you know, I don't know how you can tread those two paths to talk about sustainability. I noticed a pink carpet, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's sustainable carpet, you're still making the carpet, putting it on there, and then where does it go? Does it go in the tip? You know, I... I think that you, I would love to know more about his commitment to things like sustainability yeah. and female representation. Yeah, because he does talk about sustainability, but there aren't any clear, there's no real transparency of what that means. Yes. Is it kind of reclaimed fabrics? Is it working to recycle his offcuts? What What is it about? I mean, well, I, I think, think to, to, sorry. Not to, I think to be fair, it's quite hard, you know, there are different ways of being sustainable. Mm. and one way is to have a smaller operation mm -hmm. and he does try and keep his production UK centric yeah. um, he does try and produce most of his product in his studio in Peckham um, and again to be fair he was doing it he was he was doing the sustainable stuff which is now very mm. um, trendy a few, right from when he first started yes. and Stella mm. McCartney worked with him right at the beginning mm. after his MA mm. show yeah. because she recognized his yeah. Um, sustainable credentials and he was working with vintage fabrics mm -hmm. and so on so yeah. I think even just having some sort of awareness of it and talking about it you've got to give him mm -hmm. some sort of credit oh, totally. for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and he, he does op ha operate an open door policy in his studio where students and young designers can come and use his equipment and learn from him which is amazing and it's not something that I'm necessarily saying he needs to do more but I'm saying how does it how, what, what, how what does, does it mean? reach the, 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 also the say, public you know so he's like Debenhams how do you how do you weigh that up with, you know, with a... And it's because the reason why I bring it up is it's tricky as, as brand consultants to be able to help a, students or brands move forward in a more sustainable way without going, OK, what's more important, your bottom line or the planet? Because, like, doing a Debenhams Debenham range, it's great that it's a marketing exercise, but you know that those can't be sustainable pieces. Mm. Yeah, but I suppose also it's the question of sustainability. What, what does it mean mm. to different people? And when you look at his designs, they are amazing, but a lot of them aren't necessarily pieces, and I'm talking about his main line, aren't necessarily pieces that are going to be worn again and again and You're again. You're not going to get your 30 words out exactly. of Exactly. <laughs> so when you design these kind of one-off statement pieces... Is that a sustainable way of designing as well? I would take issue with that as well, because I don't know that I do agree with that. If you bought one of these pieces, which are really quite expensive, mm. um, you'd probably want to... I mean, unless you were super wealthy, you'd want to mm. get quite a lot of wear out of them. And I reckon you could style them in different ways. I mean, I've seen, like, Susie Bubble wearing mm -hmm. his pieces, and it's the same piece of styling it in different ways, so yeah. I think you can get different wears out of it. No, he did a lot of that. For example, last season, like more wearable pieces that you would see on like another party and stuff. But I think with this collection, he sort of made a statement of like ignoring that and made pieces that are really just meant for red parties carpet. or weddings or red carpet. It feels like yeah. the focus is like red carpet award season yeah. Yeah. alignment for yeah. really establishing who his different types of women will be, mm -hmm. which we will see in award season and like 
all of the big red carpet moments mm. to follow the rest of the year. I kind of feel like that's his positioning at this point because yeah. he hasn't had that opportunity up until now. He's kind of built the credentials to be able to pick and choose who he wants. So now he's been placed in a position where he can finally start to say, okay, I would like to commit to this person's vision. Even just having the two models that he has kind of championed up until now, having Amal Clooney, and then choosing Tandy Newton, it feels like the positioning is very targeted, very specific. He's, he's trying to kind of make a statement, having the, the sort of um, the nod from Stella McCartney, all of these credentials are kind of amounting to reinforcing his, his statement as a sustainable and ecologically conscious business. Um, for women mm. um, and powerful women. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely one for a powerful woman who thinks about their purchases. But um, it, yeah, it'll be interesting to see who he aligns the brand with going forward. And then, and then going back to the sort of sexy conversation, mm. it kind of intrigues me a little bit because it's almost like he's trying to kind of position himself as a version of British sexiness rather than a, a global sexiness. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a conservative, floral, like um, sensitive, but yet um, considered sexiness. Mm -hmm. Like, because there are like, you know, your, your superstar sexy heroes in fashion, like Anthony Vaccarello, for example, mm -hmm. who just gives you amazing pieces and great silhouettes and great shapes. But I feel like it's interesting to see covered up pieces that still deliver the sexy um, brief. Um, yeah, I think that's... I think it's just, maybe it's more like just, it's, it's, tr it's subversively sexy, which is mm. quite an, an English yeah. Yes. Yeah. trait in fashion. It's sort of ar aristocratic S&M kind of dungeons that, you know, that you sort of <laughs> of fable, you know? <laughs> yeah. Also, I think with that celebrity thing, I think that's just more being a bit marketing savvy mm -hmm. and understanding um, how to promote himself. Um, don't forget that, you know, he was awarded that, that, that award by the Queen, um, was it in 2018? Yeah. Um, and and since then, he's had a lot of publicity, mm -hmm. whether it's through Amal. Um, so I, that's quite a savvy marketing ploy to put these red carpet ready dresses on the runway yeah. at this time of year. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's interesting that he did get that award from the Queen, where you don't think of him as necessarily having the, the royal seal of approval in the way that he, he is sub, sub, submersive, submersive. Subversive. Mm -hmm. Subversive. Submersing himself. And he, I think he's had a lot of support from the British Fashion Council. Yeah. Yes. A lot. And I think that that would obviously have been informed by them. I don't think the Queen was like, oh, who am I going to pick? You know, no, but she would have had to approve it. She wouldn't have put her name to something that she felt could be an embarrassment. You'd like to think so. But he's the perfect story for somebody like her to support, you know, um, mm. working class well, all, upbringing, yeah. South London. South East London, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I'm always going to have a place in my heart for someone from South London. I'm a South mm. London <laughs> myself. Um, and I think that that kind of also woke something else in me, the fact that the show was in South London, it was in Peckham, under an archway. I, I feel like he is kind of keeping some of his grassroots um, um, qualities to his business close mm. to what he presents to the global it's very aristocratic. Community. It's a very aristocratic look. You know, you yeah. think it's sort of the dresses, they are like the Cecil Beaton Vogue covers. And I think it's really interesting that they've gone straight to being on the, the new wave of sort of slightly vintage Vogue covers under mm. Edward Enenfall. Yeah. You know, they have that kind of very British romance of the sort of um, Norman Hartnell or um, completely gone out of my head now. But, you know, the, he does really interestingly play with vintage and it's a tricky subject I think with his with his prints which are very very vintage prints because I, I didn't know and I don't know if anybody here knows I think you said that I know that certain vintage prints come out of license at some point at some point so this when they're not so they're, they're license free so I didn't know if he was taking getting old prints that are license free and making them or if he was actually designing them himself mm. I don't know the answer to that that's interesting. I, I don't know. I didn't know that, and I, I don't know the answer either. Um, Kobe, earlier you were saying about his business model. Yeah. So what do you think his business model is? I mean, I just think um, from a, a branding perspective, he's placed himself and aligned himself with, with key um, 
big corporations to kind of establish a luxury um, fashion British house. You know, he's had a nod from the Queen. He's had a collaboration or, um, yeah, a, a very rich collaboration with Perrier Jouet. Um, he's had a nod from Stella McCartney. He's had Amal Clooney, um, someone who is highly respected within the fashion community, wear his, his, um, one of his looks to the Met Gala. He then had Winnie Harlow um, wear his, um, one of his, a custom Well, look. so the story, was, so this yeah. is some behind the scenes gossip is that, the, the mm -hmm. dress that he designed for Amphar for Winnie Harlow, she couldn't sit down in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that, that I make reference to, there were two dresses in the, the show, they, two, they definitely couldn't walk in them. Mm -hmm. And so I just think it, it, there's, because that's my thing, I now question, there's a sort of question mark over whether it's just about image making and show making, or if there's a kind of, if, you know, if, if he is entering into the female sector of selling only clothes for women, what is this fantasy that he's portraying of women? It's nice to see in this show that he's removed the gimp masks and the mm. masked women. That was the first time that, you know, we can say, oh, it's just styling, it's just photos. But to approve that sort of thing, I'm like, well, what, what? So women are just these masked bodies to with which to, so your clothes just go down a catwalk I was mm. it made me first question of like well, what do you actually think about women are they just a vehicle for you is it just because you know you can sell your creativity off the back of women or do you really care to get involved you know because I think that rightly or wrongly I don't think a woman would make a collection like this um, but I could you argue, he, could you, I, are, I sorry. I think that when he first did those um, covered faces, he was referencing an, uh, an obscure 60s Lee Barry, artist. wasn't he? Um, no, it was Paul Harris, this artist from the 60s. He said that, um, I know that because I did a podcast with him. Uh -huh. and, um, it's good and info, I could, Well, yeah, and I couldn't find pictures of this artist for ages. Um, so he is quite obscure, but um, he, this artist made uh, life-size models of female form covered in vintage Mm. fabric with floral print and mm. the faces were covered and I think he referenced that heavily but yeah that covered face thing is really problematic today and you probably couldn't do it in the current cultural yeah. moment mm. but that was only that was only last season when he and phrased it, it was so still a bold choice for a young designer to make to make that sort of statement and it wasn't obvious like why he did it mm. and like I didn't know about the reference but I knew that when Wang Granary shot his collection it was meant to be so that the women merge into the background and the wallpaper and the location and you know like that. <laughs> which is extremely problematic yes. you know i thought we were trying to move away from the women as wallpaper kind yeah. of vibe yeah mm. yeah and if but then i guess you could argue if you know other designers at, at points in their career were considering you know, the female form, like even something as silly as going back to Vivian Westwood and the towering heels or like the, the extreme corseting. I mean, that was like, what, two decades ago though? Is, yeah, uh, but you know, um, what I'm saying is that- moved on since then quite a lot. Within the, the spectrum of a designer's career, when you look at it, like from, he's still incredibly young, mm. he's still learning quite a Are lot. Are you saying that we can all make mistakes? Yeah, yeah. I, I do believe that it might not be um, it might be an intentional mistake, it might have been a targeted mistake, but I think that um, he's still a new business and it's just interesting to see the ideas unedited, um, to see kind of where it then lies towards the end. I don't know, I, I feel like I it's quite interesting like to see it as it's happening quite raw. I feel like him taking the masks away for the first time yeah. was sort of him maybe acknowledging that what he was doing mm. so far was problematic to some. Yeah. And you know, having a cast that was, except for body, was diverse mm. within, like, for example, age, which is not something you see really often, other than like Simone Rocha or someone. Mm. I think he's trying to sort of make up for that in a way. But because um, we said before that it's like what he does is a bit subversive, with like the sort of really short baby doll shapes, but I think people did this before and it was more subversive. If you think of someone like Midam Kirchhoff, I think that was... Well, their business didn't survive. But Benjamin, oh, no, yeah. but the messaging behind it for me was more empowering or subversive than what I'm seeing here. Benjamin starred one of the shows as well. 
really? Benjamin Kirchhoff, yeah. Oh, really? That's and, not surprising. Sorry? No, it isn't at all. And, um, and then Jacob Kay styled the first show, which I, uh, which I thought was interesting. But, um, yeah, I, I completely agree with you that sometimes the business doesn't survive, but I think that... But also, I, think that is, I don't know if he's like, still getting... He's had a... Um, Richard's had a lot of funding... He's had new gen, he's had, you know, and I think it's really interesting you bringing up Medium Kirchhoff, they had the same thing. And it's not about the, the fashion industry, you know, and yes, these young designers should be supported to get where they are. It's amazing when the funding disappears where they go. Mm. And is it that because it's when, when they have to survive under own meritocracy, is this what women want to wear? Because mm. your buyer, your real woman, yeah. regardless of the amount of celebrity or the amount of editorial, because these dresses, I would be like, Yes, I want my lifetime portrait taken in one of these dresses. The real, the real survival of a business outside of what we, our bubble in the fashion industry is whether people can access this brand and if they're going to, you know, continue wearing it and continue loving it and if it can stand on its own two feet. Mm. But I suppose he's, he's still really early on in his career and he's done so much to get his branding out there. So the fact that he's in Debenhams, which is you know, currently still on the British high street and really strong. So people will know the name, but they won't necessarily understand his catwalk collections, but they'll think, oh, Richard Quinn, that's lovely print. Or they'll go, or they'll go that's an interesting... I don't think it's meant to be lovely at all, is it? I mean, I think the prints are kind of like... Yeah, but I think the Debenhams collection is meant to be kind of accessible. digestible for... Yeah. A non-fashion. Yeah. Obsessed. Do you know? Did you look at the? Did you look at the matches figures of what? Like the what do the? Because matches are hugely behind Richard. Yeah, Quinn. they support. Um, and so, lot, what yeah. works for them as a what sells? What? Well, who's the? Who's the woman? Is there? A, and I know this doesn't matter. I'm just interested. I'm like, you know, mm. I just want to, you know, in a way, get deeper than just a fashion show. I mean, my understanding from talking to Natalie Kingham, who's a buying director, is that it's really, like, it's kind of almost like a grand dame of fashion-type woman who likes wearing these clothes, although you will see younger women wearing them. But I do think there's, it's a real statement piece and there's something sort of handsome about the clothes. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I, I, he's done a big collaboration with Montclair, hasn't mm -hmm. he, as yeah. well, yeah. that's just come out as well. Um, but also the other thing we haven't spoken about was the fabrics, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, he, does, he works a lot with um, fabrics and innovative fabrics. And I think um, it's quite hard to talk about when you're just looking at the pictures, but yeah. certainly with that Amal outfit he mm. did, you know, that was that sort of tinfoil effect that looked really amazing mm. um, in photos. But also, that I th and I think that's something that he should really be commended for. And I think the people who are into fabrics are really like buying his stuff as well because it is quite different. Are they are seriously getting into sort of sustain more sustainable fabrics and more kind of you know and that's why I kind of think that there's because it's very retro feeling obviously yeah. and I think it's really interesting that there are people trying to move that kind of you know what is modern in fashion you know um, we all have a, a wealth of references which you can clearly see here so you know there are people who are you know I'm going to Vin and Omi later, and this is a very different aesthetic from this, but they've harvested Prince Charles's nettles mm -hmm. to make a fabric out of. And, you know, um, and so... Amazing. I didn't know... Do you know what sort of fabrics he's making? When I spoke to him, it was... He was talking to me about the tinfoil-esque. He was talking to me about being on the MA course at St. Mm. St. Martin's and sitting on his own late at night, kind of developing these tinfoil fabrics. Um, and I know that he's definitely been interested in, in, in um, working with vintage fabrics and how mm. to make those feel modern. Yeah. Um, I would imagine that with the Montclair stuff, he's doing, moving more into high tech. But I don't know beyond that about any the fabrics. And so when you interviewed him for the podcast, did you feel that he had a definite idea of where he wants to go with his brand? I feel like he's got a really good sense of his own identity. He's, got, he's definitely got a vision and he's got something he wants to say, which is really key for a mm -hmm. fashion designer. And that's been really nice to see. And he's definitely got that point of view to put across. Um, whether he will then be invited to design for a big fashion house, who knows? But that's obviously the next mm -hmm. sort of logical step, mm. isn't it? I mean, I do but think... Is that something that young oh. designers still want to achieve, well, knowing how difficult it can be? I think what's also... I mean, 
Yeah, that's the, that's the question. But also, I do think that he's in an interesting moment right now where probably those big designers are going to be looking at women, hiring women mm -hmm. designers at this moment, aren't they? Um, so it would be interesting to see um, if he does do that or, or if indeed he does want to do that. I mean, who knows? But from a financial perspective, it certainly makes sense because it's incredibly hard to sustain any kind of brand on your own, mm. even if you've got the backing of Debenhams, H&M, um, and especially with Brexit coming up, who knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know. Do you see him going to a big brand, like a Burberry? I do see him... Well, looking at yesterday's collection, it would be, you know, rather refreshing, I think, to see him <laughs> at Burberry. <laughs> I do, I do think he, he has that ambition, definitely, and he's kind of creating these visions, these worlds. And actually, it's interesting, I went to the pre preview of the Tim Walker exhibition yesterday, and it's mm. you know, amazing. But, and, that's, and he's a really important reference for Richard. And you can see kind of that, that world building is a real skill past pattern cutting, print designing, marketing. Being able to create this world is something that we want to be immersed in fashion or beauty or something just special. And especially now in this, in this time of everyone living on their screens, to be able to bring that into real life is something really important. So it'd be interesting to see if he can go forward with his own boutique at some point and what that, would, what that experience would entail. Um, we've been speaking for ages. Should we actually look at the collection? Yes. Yeah. Have we got a video? Oh, we don't have a video. Okay. Um, I really loved the Erin O'Connor and Jade Parfit mm. looks. It was mm. sort of refreshing to see them come out. To me, that looked very. It really Do you suited. Mean as a representation of women, or just what they were wearing. No more what they were. Anything. It's what they were wearing and the way they look just seemed to marry really well. And I felt like that really represented what he's trying to say in that he's a British designer mm -hmm. with a really unique point of view. And it felt almost like tre treading that fine, like that line between eccentric, but also sort of high fashion and quite mm -hmm. glamorous. I thought I just thought that worked really nice, nicely. Yeah. Some of the shapes remind me of Red mm -hmm. which is interesting as in, you know, you said earlier that you don't really see, you wouldn't really see a female designer do something like this. And then there's Red who is sort of, I guess, the representation of this type of aesthetic, but from a woman's point of view on how the two... Um, I think this is, this feels much more kind of hard yeah, for than sure. anything that, you know, and they've built their reputation, you know, it's been like, flowers in the hair and stuff like that you know it's just kind of like does yeah. it, again it doesn't mean it's a bad thing I just think it's a it's just that's the, maybe the Britishness the of it I think it's the I think it I don't think it's a Britishness I think it's a kind of it's his fascination I think with a kind of hard an S&M hardness mm. I think that that is that's his thing you know it's um, I think you're right to, re to reference Lee Bowery as well, because there is mm. a sense of club of 80s club mm -hmm. nights in there as well. Yeah, you get that as yeah, well. that Blitz Kid look is, mm. is obviously something that he's worked on for a while. But so when when you look at the collections, do you see pieces that you would want to style to 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 buy? Is this something that y you would? kind of buy into as a, as a brand if, you know, perhaps money were no object, so it's maybe a bit of a different thing, but is this something that you see fitting into your personal wardrobe or on a shoot? And they're a stylist dream, like, without a doubt. Mm. You, know, you just go, job, you get, just get one dress, job done, yeah. you know, it's amazing. You know, from a female point of view, I have more questions, I'm going to say questions, not issues, mm -hmm. about it, because, you know, it, I, you know, I used to dress like this, yeah. but then, you know, <laughs> like, you know, I did, I was always going out being crazy. You still and, do, don't you? Well, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and it's just that thing, it's like, like I said, I would definitely love to have that, this sort of, like, 
portrait in it, but whether I can, you know, I know the realities of my life now. I'm not going to be rushing to a store and being like, how can, how can I possibly get my hands on one of these? Because I think, you know, m my life just isn't, isn't that, mm. that my life as a woman is, is not this lifestyle. That's just me. Yeah, but yeah. it's not clothes. It's not your day, every day running to the corner to the laundress to buy a pint of milk. Kind no. of thing, is it? It's very much a statement. Well, they yes, would but... shoot it like that. Tim Walker, Tim Walker would shoot it like that. Yeah. Do you know what yeah, I mean? It's this guy kind of like... <laughs> But you can imagine it's quite a statement making pieces like if you wanted to wear you know like mother of the bride or something mm. rather glam like a glamorous event i imagine um, if you go to a lot of galas i can yeah. imagine young women enjoying those sort of chung sam-esque mini dresses mm. that are a bit 90s feeling um they look sort of uh, sexy and wearable in yeah. a cool way to me I think there's a really kind of a, there's definitely a range of women in here. Mm -hmm. or none of them plus, none, none of them above a size eight, obviously. You know, I think that this aesthetic. I, I I like the fact that he's included age in this. You know, I would like to see in every single runway now some body diversity because mm. it that's true inclusion. Um, I mean, I think that you could say, you know, the, the, the opera coats and stuff like that, where you could put a, a larger body underneath it. Mm. I just wish he had. Yeah. And so, when you talk about kind of body diversity, sustainability, these are all issues that are becoming ever more important. And do you think that fashion, especially, well, I suppose young designers are held to account a lot more mm -hmm. than bigger brands, but do you think that this is something that's actually going to impact fashion and the way people design, the way people on shows, the way the fact that industry flies from city to city months of, of the year, the fact that the cruise shows happen and they're kind of comp competitive spectacles. Do you think that this is a point where the fashion world is going to press reset and it's going to go back to salon shows? It's going to go back to a world of not globalisation, not the same boutique on every, on every kind of... Uh, like the city's main shopping street with... Well, I mean, if you know that this is what you should expect from his shows, you would rather fly out and be there in person than mm. watch it online. So yeah. I don't think it really does anything in that sense, because, you know, if, like it could be focused on like, for it to look good on like a digital platform and not necessarily something you want to witness in person. So I don't know if it would change anything in terms of the format of fashion. Like I think it more just like feeds into that idea of like grand shows that you want to attend and mm -hmm. be there. I mean, are you saying that should fashion care about its footprint? Should fashion, you know, there is a thing that we could be like, well, fashion's never going to be sustainable, so does, should anybody do anything about it? Mm. Or, you know, is it a time that we all need to start considering you know, we are in the top five most polluting industries in the world. That includes fuel and fracking and all of that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, we're considering there could be a different way. It would certainly, we'd certainly have to work hard to readjust the theatrics of how fashion is presented, mm. you know, because, but no fashion shows are, are sustainable. No. Mm. But even someone like Gabriella Hurst in New York, who made her show Carbon Neutral, it's still... It's not just about carbon, or Gucci that has declared itself carbon neutral. It's not just about carbon. It's about resources and what ha the life cycle of fashion. Mm -hmm. But I feel, I feel that the fashion industry has accelerated in the last five, ten years. And that's probably driven by social media um, and a lot of other things, people seeing fashion as, you know, a business venture capitalism rather than what it once was, which was, you know, perhaps starving artists, which wasn't sustainable either for different reasons. But do you think, is it too, are we too far gone down this road to put, to press pause and say, hang on, is there another way? And is there a way where these are creative people, they should be able to kind of come up with a solution for the collection, you know? And publish that or send that out to people, rather mm. than um, to put money into a show production. Mm. Just think of all the free advertising he gets from people promoting the show on their social media feeds that you wouldn't get yeah. by promoting the mm. film. You wouldn't get the regrams. Also, I just feel like he's part of a grand tradition. It's like put on a big spectacle, mm. people can go mm. and see it. 
Um, and he is a small operation. The fact that he does this is quite amazing. And he doesn't do that. It does feel like that flying around the world to every part of the world to see the cruise shows and feels a bit like we've reached peak mm -hmm. cruise show in the yeah. glamorous location thing, doesn't it? Yeah, but this with is he just sets like put up in the put in the bins. But then, if there. he could do that, would he? You don't. You don't. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, I my, the model that I'm trying to work on because it is the big question. It, you know, is fashion as a concept? Can fashion be sustainable? And should and are we responsible for doing anything about it? Mm. The, the, By we, do you mean the industry? As the industry, yeah. And so the model that I'm trying to work on is slow fashion, mm -hmm. faster delivery. Mm -hmm. So we, I work for a print, uh, a, a textile designer, much like Richard, called Kitty Joseph. And um, so what she will do is, it's basically bespoke. It's made to order. And so this is the sustainability of wholesale, seasonal wholesale, you know, it go, go, going on, it being reduced, you know, if it doesn't sell, this model is, is fast fashion, even, even if it's high priced fashion. Mm. So it, it's a, the big question that everyone's trying to answer right now is, can it be sustainable or do we just all have to stop, which is not gonna happen. No. So if we're not gonna stop, what do we do about it? So we're trying to do, we don't stockpile stock. You know, what we do is people order it, they can make it to their size, we have the fabric there. So we're not making tons of stuff and selling it and then it being reduced in its you know, price and meaning by it doesn't sell on that season, so it's, mm -hmm. it's useless. So that's what I'm trying to do. Whether it's, you know, whether you can do that for a bigger business. I mean, this stuff looks like couture. Yeah. But it's, so he's, there's a lot of people banding around the word couture. But unless it's being made for, you know, one person or mm. a few people, uh, sustainability, sustainability in London, you know, if he's going to keep what, so after the Queen, he went to from 15 to 45 yeah. sales yeah. outlets. And if that keeps growing, the question is, is uh, for How everybody, he can yeah. he scale that in London? And that will be his biggest challenge, which he de definitely will need support for because it's all of our questions. But also, what's the, I mean, the, the the pieces he makes for Debenhams, the line he creates for Debenhams, what's the sustainable um, credentials. line credentials on that? Um, and, you know, because that's obviously supporting him and helping him develop mm. this. Um, but does it feel a little bit like um, the right hand's doing one thing and the left hand's doing another? You know, yeah. does he need to align that just to make sure his messaging well, is... He definitely did, you know, take on sustainability before it became such a big issue. But mm. I think it definitely is the case that a lot of designers are doing something so they can say that they are sustainable. Mm. You know, if you think about the fact that fashion, like people want to fashion, um, cancel a fashion week and how we need to find a new format and maybe as an alternative to that shows and designers could be more sustainable with their design, it's kind of pressing for people to do something to get away with a sustainable label on their collections. Yeah. But he, he seems to be part of that generation where sustainability is just an issue for them. Yeah. Well, so it wasn't, nobody had to be responsible beforehand, now it's dumped on everybody yeah. that's new and you're suddenly like, well, hang on a second, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, I hear you. Yeah. And it, it's not like retrofitting sustainability into his business model. It's no, not, yeah, he's been talking about it from the yeah. beginning yeah. and he's yeah. definitely he's of that generation. I mean, he's a millennial, yes. isn't he? Or maybe even yes. what generation, yes. the next one along after mm -hmm. that, because he's so young. Um, and so he's definitely been talking about it right from the beginning and I think he should be commended for that. He's not mm. jumping onto the bandwagon and suddenly saying he's not going to produce fur or yes. do collections with fur and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think he's definitely, he should, and I, th I think it's, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, as someone who loves fashion, I think this is great. It's, it's fashion, yeah, as, is fashion as spectacle, mm. incredibly beautiful. It has like so many layers, a, a, like a, a varied amount of women, so many ideas, like um, a grandeur show that you want to kind of have in, in the UK. I feel like having a British fashion moment, like the one that he's created is kind of needed. It's quite mm. interesting. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just, and also quite interesting what you, that it is, um, it does feel like um, it's so grand and it isn't about trends, is it? It's not like a yeah, trend, it's not fitting it's into. Separately. But his influence like on other designers has been really apparent. You can tell kind of, he's made people sit up and take notice. Yeah, and I feel like he's conscious of that the fact that, you know, by him creating this world, it will bring people to him and, mm -hmm. like, creating that signature, however sustainable or not it is, 
allows for the market to come to him rather than yeah. him to go to the market. And it's just quite a modern idea, isn't it? Creating pieces that aren't just have to fit into that one season and then you get rid of them and yeah. buy, on, get, buy into the next trend. Like you if would... he's doing wholesale, that is, that's the model. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, he is he's creative, he's, he's, doing, yeah. Yeah. he's doing seasonal collections, just which by the, with yeah. the very nature of it, they'll mm. get reduced and sold off because they didn't sell that season. If, you know, whether he, because he is so young in, in his career, whether he, anybody can, can command that kind of power to go, I'm gonna do collections when, when I want to, mm. put them in at the right time and work with the retailers to be like, you, you can't, these are, these are forever pieces and they should stay on there until they sell. You know, it's, yeah. you, know, you think about the matches buyers being like, just, it's not feasible. Mm. But it's interesting, isn't it? The way that we kind of, we build our wardrobes in a much more realistic way than buyers necessarily have to build their stock for the season. We, mm. we invest in one or two pieces a season. If that's gonna be a Richard Quinn piece, it's gonna be probably something that is gonna stand alone and it's not necessarily gonna work with other things in your wardrobe, unless maybe you are Susie Bubble and you can kind of create that really eclectic look. But do you think that bothers him at all? Do you think he's happy that he stands separate? I think designers of clearly of, of his kind of vision, mm. it's, it's, again, it's fashion, fashion. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's like a bigger picture. I don't think that they want to sort of get sort of bogged down by the sort of vagaries of everyday life. No. It's not the vision. So whether we can task him with that at all, mm. you know, he's clearly going, well, you know, I don't really care about what women have to go through in their everyday lives. This is maybe about a moment of giving them some, a moment of putting on high drama and they are lifted out of the drudgery <laughs> of, you know, every late day lives. If you, you know, A, if you can afford it, B, you know, and that kind of thing. Mm. So, you know, I don't think he would be troubled. And, you know, unless obviously he's going to do a John and, Jonathan Aston tights collection, you know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. who knows how you keep a business afloat. Mm. It is tough. Yeah, and I suppose it's just, it's, it's different because so many designers, both male and female, are discussing the woman, the woman at the heart of the collection. Mm. What does my woman want to wear? What does she want her clothes to say? What does her life consist of? How can I dress her? How can I please her? Whereas he's kind of saying, this, this is it, and it, the woman can be formed around it to a certain degree, do you think? Well, the dress wears the woman rather than the woman wears the dress. Well, not necessarily to put it like that, but, you know, as you were saying, Winnie Harlow couldn't sit down. Sit down. It. Yeah. And that's not necessarily a consideration. I guess it's a collection for a woman who's shopping for a specific event and not mm. really for her everyday wardrobe. Yeah. Which if, you know, if she, he would do custom pieces or like a salon, as we said before, it would make more sense with what he does, I think, than do wholesale. Mm. And then, We've been talking about kind of the opportunities that he's had with Debenhams, with H&M, with Montclair. Mm. Do, you, do you think that designers of, at his stage have the ability to say no to those sorts of things? Do you think he's been offered he's still getting... multiple deals that he's said, no, thank you, that's not right for my brand? And that's kind of, those are the ones that... I guess it depends on how much you spend on your productions and how much your clothes cost to make mm. because they, these samples look expensive. Yeah. And you know, if you can't get by on like new gen, you know, he thanks new gen in his notes, he's still getting funding. Mm. Um, it, it, so, you know, it's kind of, you know, do, so perhaps he has to take Debenhams for the money to sponsor the, the you know, this is Julian McDonald's. Um, model that he does his London Fashion Week show. It costs a lot of money, it's very fashion. He doesn't really sell any of it, but it's then it, it's funded by Debenhams. Yeah. It's just his show his show thing. So again, you know, you can you have to filter fashion through so many different kind of opinions. You know, I have an opinion about it. You guys have a different opinion mm. about it. So it doesn't mean one thing to anybody, but it will be interesting to see, you know, if 
like with any of these really super creative designers that what happens when they have to stand on their own two feet yeah when the funding's gone and so how, how much longer will he have new gen for or is this his last I season don't know. i don't know but he also one thing we haven't spoken about is his um he does create prints for other houses mm. and doesn't he yeah. was it jw anderson i can't remember Maybe. I'm sorry? Mimi Wade. Mimi Wade. No, she prints there. He doesn't make oh, prints for Right, her. so he has this sort of open studio policy where people can come and use his mm. resources and there is this sense of creating a designer, art, um, art, creative community mm. in South East London. Um, and I'm sure that must be a revenue stream as well. It's a very, really clever thing to do. It is. Clever. Yeah. I suppose it's just that kind of, that side hustle mentality that so many people in fashion need to have. But like Richard Saunders used to do that. I mean, he didn't own it, but there was the Brixton print works because print is, you know, it's, it's kind of mm. tricky in London, yeah. depending on where you're doing it. And, you know, but yeah, Rick, um, Jonathan yeah. Saunders used to run the Brixton print works and, and it's like how they used to bring up young talent. And, you know, I, and I, I know that there must be a sort of community, mm. community here. It's a big task for him. Yeah. And again, going back to, I guess, the floral print and him kind of coining this specific area and then utilizing that as a selling point with mixes of like different techniques of how he's incorporating the floor into his design that could then be adopted by bigger fashion houses where he doesn't necessarily have to go in as a designer for the house. We've seen, you know, um, Wells Bonner doing collaborations with bigger houses. I feel like his techniques and even just what's happening with Dior menswear at the moment, his techniques can be utilized in other areas of luxury houses. Mm -hmm. and it's so, his look, his look is so signature. Yeah. You, as another brand, you'd have to be so absolutely sure of what you're yeah. doing to be able to invite somebody who's got such a, you know, a, a young, brilliant, fresh mm. identity to come in. Mm. It almost cancels itself out in a way, you know, because he's, is he a print designer? No, he's a designer. Yeah. yeah. You know, you couldn't see Valentino being like, oh, let's get yeah. Richard Quinn in. So how is he going to develop revenue in, in that kind of way? Who knows? But, you know, he's definitely going all guns out and being like, okay, if I'm not doing that, I'm doing this and I'm doing it like a million thousand percent. Mm. Mm. So, any further thoughts, or should we wrap up there? No? Okay, great. That's it. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Um, sorry, just waiting. Thank you to all our panellists. Uh, thank you all for watching. For more extensive Fashion Week coverage, be sure to visit showstudio.com. And if you're watching via Show Studios YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe below, and we'll see you next time.